in a unique dynamic, especially in a unique dynamic like uh, the pandemic, right? You know, we had to learn how to broadcast from home essentially. But what I chose to do during the pandemic was resign from my network news job and launch a tech company. And so now I have a media-based tech company that matches subject matter experts to media outlets across the globe, from podcasts to television shows, radio shows. And so I do spend a lot of time with people who are aspiring to be on air and helping to help them uh, improve their presentation skills. So I think that's a little bit about me. Um, I think that's probably enough about me, you think? Well, listen, there's a lot more, but we, we could go on and on about you, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So I think, Radia, if I have to go ahead from you, I will share my screen and mm -hmm. we will get this presentation and party started. Yes. All right. Well, again, I am Crystal Berger. I am going to be your presenter for today. And I'm really excited because I heard that there are a lot of newbies in the room. So folks who may be engaging in their first full-time employment opportunity, there may be people who want to scale or they're in a certain season in their journey where they want to take the skill sets that they've acquired in corporate, you know, in their business environments or their nonprofits and then transition them into something uh, long-term or maybe something a little more scalable. And so when Radia came to me and said, we need to do a rock your presentation uh, uh, session, I said, this will be really good. And so, you know, because I am going to be teaching a lot, uh, some of the presentation skills that you get here, I might not be exhibiting them because I want to teach you versus just talk to you. Um, but, you know, in this whole idea of rocking your presentation, I came up with a great acronym and it was just present, right? Just present. And so the P is for prepare. You want to rehearse. You want to extract, show, emphasize narrow it down and then tie it all together, right? So if you think about where we want to go in this conversation, I want you to think about those verticals when you're actually preparing for your presentation that you want to rock. And so with that, um, so with that, the whole idea of rocking this presentation is that there are seven steps that I want you to think about taking when it comes to creating a dynamic presentation. And whether it be visually and aesthetically, like I think that's a whole nother deep dive because Radia knows that I can really do some things with Canva, um, but I want to give you the fundamentals of the content that will have your presentation be really compelling. And I also would love for people to engage in the chat and Radia, if any questions come through, any notes come through, feel free to shoot them to me throughout the conversation so we can address them as we go along. So again, present, right? Present. So the P stands for prepare with purpose, right? Prepare with purpose in mind. Uh, rehearse in advance, right? Extract the data, show and tell, emphasize the takeaways, narrow it down, and then tie it all together. Tie it all together and you will rock your presentation. And I'm going to go into each of these individually, but I wanted to give you an overview of how you should lay out your presentation. So in the beginning of presenting anything, you want to orient your listeners or your viewers to what you're actually going to talk about. And so always start with that process of giving them an overview so they know what to anticipate. A lot of times you'll get presenters, they'll talk about their own personal experience, which is, which is great. And then they'll just go into points and they haven't given you an opportunity to prepare within the presentation for the presentation. So in this part of the, pr the process, I would say, encourage your viewers to get out a pen and paper, right? You know, grab your notebook, make sure that you're comfortable, and then you give them the outline for the conversation. So when we talk about preparing, you know, with your purpose in mind, right? Really think about, well, why is this conversation going to be important and what is the intent? Right. And this is something that you guys probably learned in elementary school, you know, about the, the purpose of a narrative. Right. It's either to inform, to educate, to entertain or persuade. Right. And when you go into these conversations, you really want to know, am I coming here to inform someone of some new information? Right. Just giving them the data. You know, you may have a professional development for your department, right? And you may wanna inform them of what's happening in the department, whether you're increasing the numbers or areas that you need to work on, right? And you'll have that overarching purpose of your conversation or your presentation. So if it's to inform, stick with that. If it's to educate, and sometimes these will have subsets, sub-verticals, but you'll have one overarching theme. 
Um, but the primary one you really need to identify at first is this presentation to educate, right? Paul's on here, so he knows a lot about educating, right? A lot of his presentations are, you know, how to approach, you know, your contracts. How do you, uh, so the how-tos of the world would be those educational presentations that you need to do. Are you doing a presentation just to entertain, right? Is this something where you're going on, you're sharing an experience, you want people to engage with your product and you want it to be really entertaining, right? Or is it to them to persuade is it to persuade them to do something? So for me, being in tech, I found myself having to pitch to a myriad of people now, right? So on one side, I'm pitching to investors. On another side, I'm pitching to potential customers. And then on the other side, I am uh, pitching to allies or um, affiliates, right? And so I'm trying to persuade them to do something. So depending upon the purpose, right, of your presentation is really going to identify and inform the flow of it, right? And so if you don't take that moment in the beginning to know why, why you're there, right, why you're presenting, then your audience will walk away and be like, well, what was that about? Like, you know, why, why am I here? So today, my purpose for this presentation is simply to educate. Now, when we talk about rehearsing in advance, right, um, there are certain things that you should do when you're actually rehearsing, and it's critical that you do this. I'll give an example, and I'll give an anecdote. So for me, when I came into the newsroom, I never worked in a full-scale newsroom before going to network news, right? So I was an intern for six months at a local CBS affiliate in Baltimore, and then I went straight to network news. And so... For me, that was a huge learning curve. And you may be in environments right now where there's a huge learning curve. And the only way that you can tackle that is to actually practice in advance, like truly practice how you want to show up. And so for me, what I did on my own time, I would go into Fox every Saturday. I did this for a year, y'all, every single Saturday. And because I knew I wanted to be on air, even though I wasn't quite, quite ready just yet. And I sat in front of the teleprompter and the CEO at the time of the company had someone come in on their breaks and they would run prompter for me. And I would sit there for four hours every single Saturday on my own dime and practice the teleprompter. Now, of course, this might seem tedious. It might seem redundant. It might seem extra sometimes. But depending on the level of impact you want to have and how, you're com how much you're committed to the purpose, right, of your presentation or what you're doing is really going to matter about how you actually do this practice. So one thing you want to do is choose and practice your transitions. When you're going from slide to slide to slide, know how you want to position and move the conversation forward. I'm sure that there have been some people on here who you've been to a presentation and you kind of feel like it's disjointed, right? The personal jump from thing to thing, thing to thing. And typically what's happening there is they're not showing you a smooth flow of how, how the things connect, right? So look and say to yourself, how do you want to move it um, forward? Do you want to use transitional words and phrases? Do you want to tell a story, right? Do you want to be the person that's just outlining something high level and with the then, next, and finally? But make sure that you're, or you might say point one, point two, point three, but make sure that you're practicing those transitions. Now, verifying your timing, this can be a challenge, but I'm giving you some quick tips under each of these, right? So when you're looking at timing, there's a thing in your Google Docs or your Word Doc where you can actually do a word count, right? And your word count can help you with your timing. So sometimes we'll want to um, freestyle a lot, right? Which is great. I do a lot of freestyling in my presentations, um, but that has come with practice. But what I recommend is take all of the words within your presentation and put them in a Word document, make it really simple, and then go to the tab and see what the word count is. And for every 160 characters, that's about one minute of speaking time, right? And so think about it like that. So think about if you have a slide that has 160 words on, which I would not recommend, right? But if it has 160 words on the slide, know that that's about a, a, a minute of reading time, but then you have to factor in how long does it take you to get from thing to thing. One thing I love to do is I'll go through each of my presentations and I'll record it on audio just naturally, right? I'll look at all of my main points. I'll have the presentation done and then I'll record it on my audio recorder and I'll do the actual presentation and I'll get a timing there, right? And so if you're in a pitch competition, for example, you might want to do that and time it and then see if you need to do it in four minutes 
you can listen to that audio and then you can take that audio and put it into a platform like Fireflies AI, right? Which is a transcription service, which will transcribe your audio, right? And that transcription will then give you the timing of your actual whole presentation with your freestyle, right? So there are ways that you can time it out and I recommend that you take the time to do that so that you can kind of go with the flow and you're not rushing towards the end of your presentation. Last thing I'll say about timing, if you're a person like me who sometimes goes a lot into anecdotal stories, I would say have a counter in front of you um, while you're presenting where you can see it. Of course, your audience can if you're doing it from a Zoom or if you're in a room full of people, right? Like this picture, have someone that's in the room that's counting time for you. So for me, I know I have two backups. I have myself, I have my clock, and then I have Radia, right? And so when I see her face kind of like, okay, CB, go to the next thing, you know, then I know my timing is expiring in that particular area. So figure out how you want to do your timing, but make sure that you do those other verticals in advance. Now, polish up your overviews, right? It goes back to the very second slide that you saw in the presentation. You want them to be short and concise, right? You don't want to have a lot of words. You just want to give people something in three to four words that they can fully understand what the topic of this slide is going to be, right? So just like this slide here, it's rehearse in advance. It's simple. So everybody here knows that this part of the presentation is going to be about that. So polish up the overview so they're clear. And then they also are, are things that can be takeaways from the presentation. Now, get input on phrasing. And what I mean by this is, and I'll do another anecdote here, by me transitioning into the tech realm, being a non-technical founder, there are a lot of um, acronyms, you know, words that they use in the trade, right, in the industry that I wasn't familiar with at first. Things like valuations, cap tables, um, you know, how are you going to scale the product? What's your ROI? All of these terminologies and phrasings that are industry specific, make sure that you become familiar with the phrasing if you're presenting to a new audience, right? And so it could be either them learning something about you, right? And if you are teaching them something about your community, then make sure you identify what your core phrasing is for that particular industry, right? And so um, be able to communicate that phrasing clearly and concisely. One thing that I love and I had to start doing was having um, my team fire off questions to me, right? Like, because when you're presenting, you need to be able to be the authority in this space. And so you're not going to think of every question that your audience would think of, right? Or you may be presenting something that appears clear to you, but it doesn't seem clear to who's listening to you. So it's always great to have a team. And when I say your team, the team could be your three kids, you just pick up and you know, they're in high school. You say, all right, y'all, I need y'all for 10 minutes, right? I need to go through this and ask me all the questions that you have. And actually, you really want to actually get in front of people who aren't necessarily that familiar with the topic so that you know, especially in an instance where you're informing or educating, that you're being very, very clear on the concepts that you're communicating. And then practice your responses to those questions, right? So don't just have them, don't just have them ask you the questions and then you answer them. Really take time to process how you're responding to the question and then go in and modify and perfect the answers to your question. Uh, in my whole pitch process, I was realizing that uh, after pitching to about three or four investors who were not media industry specific, they had a lot of questions about what were the newsroom operations. So going into the conversations, I was responding as if they knew what a newsroom functioned like, right? But based upon their questions, I was starting to tweak my responses. And so then when I went into future pitches, I had better presentation skills based upon the questions that they were asking me. So don't be afraid to have people ask you questions and then don't be afraid to challenge your own responses because you don't know everything, right? <laughs> and then the last tip on rehearsing in advance is relate to your overall theme always, right? So for me, I'll always go back to present, right? Pre prepare, rehearse, and then I'll keep going after this one. But, you know, you want to make sure that you always take your listener, your viewer, um, your audience into consideration and tie it in after each and every slide if you need to. 
Now, data. Data is so critical today, right? Data can be the thing that really takes you from closing the sale, getting the promotion, um, you know, getting the role that you desire, or just even having some level of impact with the community that you want to have. Uh, for example, I was at a uh, an event yesterday, and they were talking about um, violence increase within Baltimore City, and the young man who was presenting, he gave some strong statistics on the number of murders and Baltimore being number two in increasing homicide rates with only 6,000 people within this region, right? I mean, 600,000 people within this region. And then he further went in and said, we were number one per capita over the number one city with homicides because of the amount of people that actually live within this area and region. And so, because they were doing a violence intervention and prevention project, that data really resonated with us as the audience to show us the importance of the project that they were presenting to us. And so there are four ways that I like to present data and there are about eight or nine, eight or 10 ways that you can present data. But these are my top four because they always seem to be the, the most um, visually effective. And I'll show you each one of them. So there are four effective ways that I showcase data, right? A pie chart is always very easy to show people exactly what's happening, right? To be able to, for them to see the numbers, right? So if you were to do that whole 600,000 out of, you know, uh, whatever number of cities in a pie chart, people could see that very clearly and they identify it. Another one that's really good is a pictograph, right? A pictograph, it'll show you something like this as far as the number of countries that have been visited very simple pictograph here, shows you the country with the picture, right? And then it gives you the briefcases, right? Where you're traveling, I mean, the suitcases where you've traveled to and people can see that picture clearly. A heat map, we see this a lot of times during um, political season, right? You'll see who's hot, who's blue, who's red and what, and what areas. And it gives people a very quick, easy, easily digestible visual, right? That shows the data that you wanna convey. And then the fourth one that I really like, that I've come to like, that I was resistant to at first was the tabular, right? Or the tabular, right? So this here is a table that you can extract from like an Excel document, right? Maybe you're showing the growth of the organization and users, um, or maybe you're showing how much revenue you're generating from quarter to quarter or from year to year. And this is something that I've realized a lot of investors. So if you're pitching to that archetype, right? If you're pitching to that type of person, know that they really get excited about tables, right? Like they wanna see everything in a table and don't be afraid to cut and paste the table and make the table pretty. Uh, one resource that I love, um, again, as I mentioned earlier is Canva. Canva has, has made so many people master presenters, right? You can go in and you can put in the data you can choose what type of graph you want, and then you can say, okay, this is the data, and it'll create the graph for you, right? So sometimes these things may look a little complicated, but you have so many tools and resources to help you create these. But these are the top four ways that I like to visually show data. And one thing about data, data typically always validates your purpose, right? It always says, okay, well, if I'm here to educate people on the reasons why we should get engaged in early voting, right? Having data and statistics to show the difference over time is really great, but you don't wanna crowd your slides with too many numbers and little visuals because people won't even be able to read it, right? So if you do use the table, make sure that you only highlight the top two to three things that you wanna showcase. And then you can give them an extension to say, if you wanna know more, I'll throw a tab, you know, I'll throw a link into the chat or you know, uh, we can email follow up on those particular um, data points if they have more questions. So I'll stop right there. I see some information in the chat. I'm not sure if it's any questions or anything uh, so far, but I know we only have 30 minutes and I do want to get to everything, but was there anything there for Dia? Um, a couple of people said Canva is fire. <laughs> they love Canva. <laughs> Canva. And I have to say, yes, for sure. Um, I use Canva and I'm Listen, I'm a basic, basic, basic user, and it makes my presentations look halfway decent. I make flyers and stuff. So yeah, we love that. Yes, yes. So the next point is the S, right? Show and tell, right? The show, show and tell. People want to see stuff. 
Now, um, I'm going to get into data. And don't be afraid to have your notes. because I have notes here because there's certain things that I really want you to know about, like in a demo, which should show up, right? So for demos, demos can be challenging for a variety of reasons, right? One, you're typically teaching somebody something about something they don't know, right? But then you're also navigating, like whether you're using your hands or you might have an assistant, someone there that's actually clicking from thing to thing that you're demonstrating, right? And then on top of that, you probably have something playing in the background, right? It might be a video. It might be, you know, a, a, a scroll that you're scrolling to show them how to use something. So I always say when you're demoing a product, prepare a script. This is the instance where you do want to have something to read, right? And the great thing is tools like um, tools like Zoom, you can actually notate your own notes in the Zoom uh, column. So it's only visual to you and really take time to uh, go to YouTube and learn how to use these tools efficiently, right? Because you might be missing up on something that uh, could make your presentation easier. So the first thing under a demo is you want to prepare a script, right? Script it out. Go from slide to slide, from click to click, from video to video, and know what it is that you want to say. Because the other part about a demo is People typically don't have to see your face in a demo unless you want to, right? But if you're showing a product, you may even want to kill your video and just let the demonstration be the focus of the conversation so you can read your script conversationally, right? Then you want to tailor the demo to the specific audience. And this is something that took me a lot of time to um, identify as a founder, right? When you're just working in one space, right, you may only have one target audience, but if you're building what we call like a marketplace or a three-sided product or you want a three-sided outcome, you have to take that presentation and make it applicable to multiple audiences, right? That demo to multiple audiences. So me demoing my uh, product to an investor sounds and looks very different than me demoing it to a expert that I want to sign up. And it looks different for the person that I want to buy it, which is like a TV, radio, or podcast, right? So it could be the same exact visual aesthetic of the demonstration, but you need to practice tailoring that particular demo to each audience that you want to address. So take some time and say, am I presenting to my manager, right? Am I presenting to my team? Am I presenting to a outside vendor, right? All of those will dictate how your demo flows. And y'all, I know we got a lot of stuff going on and you like, I don't want to do three separate demo scripts, but you should because it's really going to impact how you show up on, the, on in the long term and the result that you get as well. Um, and then provide different use cases for the demo, right? Uh, you want to show every single way that this demonstration applies, right? So even though, you may um, only be pitching to experts that you want to use this particular product, but you know you also need to get stations on board. You need to be able to identify each way that a person will use the thing that you're demonstrating, if that makes sense. And then of course, and probably the most important piece of this is use reliable video conferencing, right? Use a platform that really works for you. If you have the option, right, if there are multiple products within your organization and you know you're just not good on Microsoft Teams, right, if you hate it and it's just not your thing, right, then say, we're going to do this on a Zoom. If you think that you're really dope on Microsoft Teams and not on Zoom, then pick which one works the best. But if you only have one option, what do y'all think I'm going to say? <laughs> practice on that particular platform, right? So when you're doing a demo, you really want to approach it tactically from that standpoint. Now, other ways that you can show and tell that really resonates with your audience is tell a story. This is my default setting all day, every day. I know for me, I have a lot going on. I'm sure you guys do as well. And sometimes my mind will just go blank, right? I'll be in the middle of a presentation and I won't know what I'm doing, who I'm talking to. And I always default to a story that really encompasses everything about the thing that I normally present about, right? And so if we're talking about the need for Ebo, which is the name of my technology. I tell the story of me being the only Black woman in the newsroom, right? And how me being the only Black woman in the newsroom was a, a, a gift to me, right? And how it benefited the news organization. And then I transitioned, right, into the importance of how my technology was built 
for people in newsrooms to say, hey, if there is no diversity in the room, you can use my technology to actually bring the diversity into the room. So tell your story that you can communicate effectively. Um, a lot of times you'll get presenters that'll come on and they'll tell you other people's stories. And as long as they have a personal connection to it, it can feel authentic. But I would say find that story that's within your journey that you can tell well to help you show and tell. The other piece of it is show compelling visuals, right? If you're in a nonprofit organization or in a space where people need to see something that they haven't seen before. Um, one example was I used to go on mission trips to Haiti and I was communicating to people to help them raise funds. And I showed people pictures of the conditions that I experienced when I was in Haiti. And there was, we were on, it was an organization called the Water Mission. There's a little boy who was drinking water that literally was jet black and it was because they didn't have running water right and so just showing that visual was compelling enough to show the purpose of the presentation if you're losing people throughout your presentation you may want to ask some provocative questions right why does why does diversity in a newsroom even matter right you know and ask them that question and look for their authentic response and be okay with asking the question that's going to make them feel a little bit uncomfortable because more than likely you'll get more buy-in to your purpose because you've asked a question that made them think about something that they never even thought about before, right? I guess under share a personal experience is very similar to, to tell a story, um, but a personal experience is how has this helped you? How does it hurt you? How can it be improved and how can it be better? And then if you're in this panel situation, um, whether it's a virtual panel or an in-person panel, one great way to show and tell and also to engage and to kind of reduce the ego, right, in your presentation is piggyback off of another speaker, right? Someone just went before you, they said something that was really compelling. And then you're also innately doing the transitions from conversation point to conversation point. So yeah, you know, just like Jeff mentioned, you know, one thing that I experienced as he did was blah, blah, blah. And it helps people to show that you're engaging, that you're aware of what's happening and also that you can help move the conversation forward. So the S is for show and tell. All right, now the E, the E, the E, the E. Emphasize your takeaways. And there are a few easy ways that you can do this with your audience, right? Remind them, again, of your why. Why is this important to them, right? Why should they care about, you know, clean border systems in Haiti? How does that impact people in the U.S., right? Um, why does it matter to use technologies in a newsroom that makes them more efficient, but then also lends itself to more diversity on air, right? So always remind the audience of why this matters. This here for you, this presentation could matter in a variety of ways, right? It can make you a better presenter to sell your products or to grow your business. It could actually help you get that promotion that you're desiring, right? Or it could just be something that you want to improve upon for yourself and your own professional growth and development. But always remind people throughout a presentation of why the topic should matter to them. Now, one thing you want to do here is utilize tonality to really emotionally connect with your audience. I have been on so many Zooms and in so many conferences, and the person is like the guys, most of y'all are probably too young for the wonder years, but. <laughs> the one he just had this teacher who just talked so monotone the entire time throughout his class, right? And the kids would just sit there. It was almost like the guy in The Simpsons is like, meh, 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 right? So you, you want to make sure that you change the tonality based upon the emotion that you want them to have, right? If there's a topic that they really need to know something about, like it's very, very important. And if we don't do something about this issue, right, that's where you want to bring the tone deeper, right? If it's something that you want them to get excited about, you want to raise the tone and maybe talk a little faster, right? And so think about how tonality can emotionally impact the conversation. And if you struggle with this, right, because for some people, it's just not a natural thing. Again, the practice is critical. Take some time and do mirror exercises, right? See how your face shows up when you are thinking about something excited, right? And replicate, it's exciting, I'm sorry, and replicate that in your presentations. So if you want people to get excited about something, then smile, you know, smile with your eyes, smile with your mouth, you know, even smile with your body language, you know, sit up straight, right? And have that authority. But depending upon how your tone is executed, it can really impact how people emotionally connect to the issue. 
So if I said to you guys, you know, I was, yeah, I was the only black woman in the newsroom for over a decade when I worked at Fox. It's like, okay, okay, girl, <laughs> right? But if I say I was the only black woman in my newsroom for a decade while I was at Fox News, right? So the tone, the speed, the energy behind it will really help you emphasize the takeaways, right? But if your entire presentation is the same exact tone throughout, people won't know what to extract because you're not giving them any cues throughout the presentation on what really, really should matter to them, right? So really think about that. And there are a lot of exercises you can do online. I'll provide a resource link to uh, Radia for some of the things that we mentioned here. And you also get a copy of the presentation as well. But just know that tonality really does matter. And the last thing is be direct, right? If you feel like you're losing your audience and you're kind of like, I had a long night, <laughs> right? And my tone might not be able to vary much then tell people exactly what they need to take away from this, right? It's like I did at the very beginning of the presentation. I'm gonna teach you guys how to present, right? And these are gonna be the main points of the presentation, right? So then that way there's no question on what they actually are gonna get out of it. And don't be afraid to be direct. You know, if you want them to know that, um, you know, the, the, these are the things that matter in growing and developing an organization, Tell them that specifically. Nobody should go into a conversation having to figure out what it is that you're talking about, even if you're going into to, to entertain. Okay. Hold on, guys. So the next part of that, after all of that, I think it makes sense is to just narrow it down, right? Narrow it down. One thing that I learned um, when I was uh, I took a broadcasting class before going to network news and they had this phrase that used to irritate me to death, right? Like, and it was keep it simple, stupid, right? It was like, keep it simple, stupid. And I didn't really understand what they were saying because a lot of us are educated. We've been to law school. We have PhDs, master's degrees. We just think that what we know is just the best thing since sliced bread. And we just want to sound so good talking about it. Narrow that stuff down, y'all. Most people, right, what I learned, most people read at an eighth grade level, right? And so that means they just read enough to be able to understand the newspaper. That's why when you watch the news, you only get it in sound bites, right? You only get a 30 second spot because people's attention and retention is very limited, right? And I'm sure the data is exponentially different with the use of all the social um, social media tools. I mean, the social interaction tools like your cell phone. And I'm sure the attention span is probably shorter than what it was a decade ago, right? So you want to keep your focus on what you want to accomplish, right? Um, it's great to get emotionally engaged and involved in the conversation, but don't ever go too far off of what is the goal here and keep that in the back of your mind, right? As you're presenting, keep asking yourself, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And it's not just because your manager told you you got to do it, right? Right? Why you you have to say to yourself, why? What do I want people to take away from it? And that's why purpose is so important, guys. Because a lot of times we'll have to do things that we don't necessarily want to do in our work day or in our entrepreneurial journey. But you have to always default to your why, so you can tap back into that focus right? And really get that excitement going for yourself. Because if you're doing presentations once a month, once a quarter, or you're doing them, I promise you, I do about six presentations in a week at least, right? And so you, it can become mundane, right? But I have to remember the reason why I created Ebo is because I want to create some level of generational legacy wealth and, a, and be able to distribute that throughout my community. So even though I might not want to get on with investors today, I might not want to talk to potential customers, I'm just going to do it because I have to go back to my why. So keep focused on what you want to accomplish. The next thing you want to do to narrow it down is simplify the points that you want to make, right? Write it out right? Write things out and then continue to scale it down, right? And, and I do my presentations visually how you see it because you want to make sure that your lines don't go fully across the actual, um, your line of content doesn't go fully across the screen because that means there's too many words there, right? If you can keep a thought to six to seven words, you have a very concise thought that people can actually consume and take away, right? And so think about that when you're simplifying your points that you wanna make. It does not have to be a dissertation. If you're presenting to people and someone in the room or in leadership or within your corporation 
or within your nonprofit knows that you're an expert at this and you don't have to prove that, right? The next thing is you wanna break your presentation into sections. Have a middle, beginning, and an end. It's just that simple, right? Have a middle, I mean, I'm sorry, a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's just think about that story. This is where I wanna start. This is what we need to know. This is the meat in the middle. And this is where I wanna bring it home. And then the last point of that is, is that identify what details have impact, right? My story is kind of like in the beginning when we started about my bio. And it's like, well, what things really matter here? The fact is you guys want to know, why is this woman qualified to talk to me about how to present, right? And my story is layered in multiple experiences from having taught high school to going to law school to having working in real estate and doing all of these things. But do those details matter to me teaching you how to present? No, you don't, right? The thing that matters is I was on camera for six years off and on presenting from Dr. Oz to uh, Trinity Broadcast Network. I wrote for Black Enterprise. I've hosted panels for the United Nations and all these other things, right? So that really validates and has impact that this woman is qualified to talk about the topic of presenting, right? So think about what specific details in your story or in the data or in the anecdote that's gonna have impact. And again, remember, keep it simple, stupid, <laughs> right? Think about those people that can only process that as far as you know an eighth grade education and you wanna talk to them in that way. And the last point on the present model is tie it all together, right? Tie it all together. Decide on that one sentence message that really matters. So an example here is you can give a really dope quote that really will sit with people that encompasses your entire presentation all in one quote. For example, when I'm talking to people, organizations that really care about social impact in newsrooms or inside and outside of newsrooms, I know that the diversity quota thing is very, very important, right? And so one of my favorite quotes is by James Baldwin. It's that, you know, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced, right? And that's why Evo is important because we want to change how news is presented and who's seen on air. And just that one sentence around change and the quote by James Baldwin that people can quote or retweet, right? It really relates back to the impact and the message and it ties the entire purpose of why somebody was to do the presentation together. So find that one sentence that really encompasses the thing that you want to accomplish within your presentation and have that memorized. Like don't read that because what you also want it to feel like is that it's coming from your soul and your spirit and your heart, right? And when things typically matter to you and you have passion, other people will get excited about the passion you have about an issue or a conversation. Give space to get into the weeds. Um, it's, this one was a good one because, again, I mentioned I went to a violence intervention and prevention project uh, event yesterday. And the presenter, it was a panel, this one gentleman wanted to just keep going. He was going too deep into the weeds at this event, right? People looking sleepy, they getting on their phones. You can tell when people are tapping out, right? And so if you find yourself in a space where you might be getting too deep in the weeds of something and you see that your audience is tapping out, give space to get into the weeds means, hey, guys, we can do a follow-up. I'm going to send a survey, you know, email me your questions. Those kinds of things really make a difference in the quality of your presentation because sometimes getting into the weeds will get you off track of your purpose as well within the conversation. Seek to clarify. Always ask people, do you have any questions? You know, is there anything that I can explain any further? Um, and really seek to be as clear as you possibly can within the presentation within the allotted time. And again, go back to number two. If you see that you need to clarify something on a deeper level, give people space to connect with you, right? To extend the conversation further or say, hey, I'm gonna take this back to leadership and see if we can do a part two to this conversation. One thing that I always love is this, they call it sandwich, right? The sandwich in a conversation when you're trying to tie things together. It's like you have a piece of bread on top, you have the peanut butter and jelly in the middle, and then you have the bottom piece of bread, right? So think of your conversations as a sandwich, right? Where do you want to start with this, right? You want to start with your acronym, then have your acronym ready at the top, 
I give them all of the details in the middle with the peanut butter and the jelly. And then you sandwich it again at the end where you actually present and you give the acronym and you can really, really rock it. One thing that I, it's a book that I read a long time ago called You Are the Message, right? And what I want to encourage everybody in this presentation is to know that you are really the message, right? You are the authority, you are the expert for that moment, for that day, or just in general. So if you don't show up in an authoritative stance that you can own this, right? No matter what you say, it's not going to matter, right? You essentially are the message, but make sure that you keep it simple as well. And the next part of this is I wanted to give you guys something that's really, really important when you want to rock a presentation, right? There are four different types of presentation archetypes, right? People that are going to show up in a presentation, right? In your audience, right? And so they're the wallflower, the questioner, the combative, and the multitasker, right? And there are multiple verticals here that you see all the time. You know your friends, you know who's at work with you, you know, you know the kinds of rooms that are in your volunteer or the kinds of people that are in your volunteer organization. So the first one is the wallflower, right? is that person that literally comes to the presentation and they just sit there the whole time and they kind of just on the wall, like not looking interested, right? So what you want to do for those people specifically is prompt them with questions, right? Make them engage in the conversation, not because you're trying to put them on the spot, but because you remember your purpose, right? You want to get them engaged. And so I said, did you come to party, right? Or did you just come here to be on the wall, right? So ask them questions ask for their input, even spark a conversation, right? If you're in an environment where you feel the tone might be too stuffy or the people might be a little too uptight, you know, ask them questions so you can get their perspective and to build on that, right? The next one is the questioner, right? This is the person that is going to ask you a thousand questions in the presentation. And I said, keep this in mind. You are not here to give somebody a PhD in one hour. Okay, so first, don't take it personal, right? The questioner is the questioner because they're the questioner, right? They're just going to be the person that everybody in the meeting is irritated to. And we like, we know Kim going to have some questions, right? That's Kim. Let Kim be Kim. Let her be great. The best way to deal with your questioners is to politely say, say if you're getting off track, right? If the questioner is going, again, too deep into the weeds, what was the other tip? Make room, right, for a follow-up. Kim, great question. You know, uh, we talked about these main points here that relate directly to your question. But listen, let's schedule a time where we can do a follow up. We can get deeper into your questions because what you don't want to do within your presentation is one, you track of your time, right? Because someone is the questioner. But also, you don't want to change your tone and your energy because you're frustrated with the questioner. The next one is the combative person, right? They're gonna go back and forth, and it ain't any questions. Well, no, I read that, you know, Baltimore was actually like one of the safest cities in America, right? And then they're going to go into it with you and really want to create a tone that can be destructive. That's why I use the word war, right? It could be destructive to the outcomes of your purpose. So when you think about your um, combative person, they're typically the person that is going to be a tough sell. And I like to say, you want to show up to your presentations with the combative person in mind because they'll have you overly prepared. That goes back to the question at the top. I mean, the point at the top when it says, go in with someone who is just that debatable friend, right? Like my brother loves to debate. He gonna debate you down to the floor, right? It could be about anything. It's the sky's blue. He's like, well, no, actually it's like a light blue with a little hint of gray, you know? And so, but make sure for that person, you have data and research, right? So when you think about the combative person, typically a person is in war with someone that they feel is unprepared, right? But when you come prepared, they know they can't fight you, right? And so that is a really great tactic is have all of your data, have all of your statistics, know what you're talking about, know your product because the combative person is gonna show up. And then the last one is the multitasker, right? Focus to you. And I'll give you guys this last anecdote because I know we're running low on time. So the multitasker is the person that's on the Zoom they reading a book, they drinking some champagne, they are, you know, on their cell phone texting. And I'm going to tell you guys, this happened to me literally in a, in a venture capital pitch. A guy literally owned a media company, young guy inherited his company from someone. And he literally picked up his cell phone so I could see it. Okay. And he was overtly doing this and he was texting on his phone. Right. So what did I do? Right. 
I went to one of my strategies. I said, um, I said to him, I said, well, I called him by his name and I said, well, how do you think my product could help you and work for you? And he looked and he was like, um, tell me a little bit more again about what the product does. You know, so I had to really bring him back into the presentation. And so make sure that you engage your multitaskers. Don't let your multitasker take you off task, right? Because in, the, in, in my mind, I was having this dialogue with myself, like this dude is real disrespectful right now, right? But I had to bring it back to my focus and my focus was to get that check from him, right? And so I had to engage him in the conversation. And I did that by prompting a question. So the last thing I would say is point out things that inspire engagement and do the pre-work it is so critical that when you're doing a presentation guys and when i say pre-work is not just your presentation the pre-work is know the organization that you're talking to right you know radia and i had a conversation i already knew about the organization at um, mahogany and i also knew about name it so i know a little bit about these organizations in advance but then we did a little bit further i said well what's the primary need of this demographic what does the demographic look like you know what would you like to for me to accomplish in the conversation, right? Those are things that you want to do in advance of your presentation. That's the pre-work, right? Before you even craft the presentation so that you can get the outcomes that you desire. And of course, last but not least would be how you guys can connect with me. Um, and then we'll open up for questions. So um, my consulting company is Burger Consulting Group and it's Burger Consulting Group Online. Please stay connected there. There's a survey on there um, that you can take to identify if you're pitchable and ready for media. Um, I'm on Instagram at CB Inspires. That is my personal page, but feel free to check it out. It is open to the public. And if you want to email me, you can email me at info at Burger Consulting Group Online. And if you want to learn more about the technology that I'm developing, it's joinebo.com. Again, it's joinebo.com. And I hope that everybody enjoyed the presentation. Oh my goodness. As you gem after gem after gem, let me tell you, uh, CB. Everybody follow Crystal on um, Instagram. She is very motivational. She's fun. She's relatable. Um, she's a Black woman in tech. She is, um, you know, a, a media maven. She is a technology maven. She, she does it all. Um, any questions? Anybody? Oh, Denya, the, my VP is clapping her hands. She said, wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Denya. Everyone, amazing presentation. Does anybody have any specific questions about um, presenting? Maybe, um, I know I always get caught up on the on the prep work. So does anybody have any, um, we're getting all the thank you crystals, very informative, great stuff. But if anybody has any questions, you can drop them in the chat or unmute yourself. We got like- and why you and while you're pulling them up, Radia, like one thing you said about the prep work, right? Um, you know, you'll get people that'll say, you know, keep it to, you know, five slides and you'll have people, they'll say, keep it to eight slides. And then some people will say 20 slides. My rule is this. I really don't particularly care how many slides you have. Just make sure that you don't overlap, overload your slides with content, right? Because the more words you have on the slide, again, it's going to make it a lot longer, right? And so you could do 20 slides and just have bullet points. Maybe it's one word on a slide and you could take that one word and present it for a couple of minutes. So don't get too hung up on the, you know, this amount of slides, unless you're in like a pitch competition where they give you regulations on no more than 10 slides, right? Then you can know to scale it down from there. But also just Google like uh, presentation templates. If you don't have a Canva account or something like that, you can go and get free presentation templates and that'll help you structure how you do some of that pre-work as well. Yes, definitely. And I did also like the point where you said to customize, just like we have to customize our um, resumes, customize your presentations. You can't use the same presentation for every um, situation. So I, I, I always emphasize customize, customize. Yes, I, I love this question. Any special tips for maintaining engagement with virtual presentations? Um, it goes back to keep it simple, stupid, right? You know, keep it simple. Um, know that you're in a medium that is difficult for people to feel your energy. And so I recommend like creating a space, right? Because again, you are the message. So for me, I got a candle burning right now. <laughs> you know, I have some natural light coming in. 
I've created a space that's going to help me bring in a better energy, right? So create a space for yourself. If you know that you have a lot of verticals, you know, you may be working from home and, you know, you have kids and a family and all those kinds of distractions. Maybe you need to go and get a WeWork room to do your presentation from. So one core thing is, is the environment that you're presenting in. You want to create that for yourself. That's really important. Another thing that matters in a virtual presentation is always the aesthetic, right? Make sure that the lens is clear when you know wipe it off with some alcohol or something or get the special wipes for your computer have good lighting um make sure that you have something in your um like i have a pillow behind me right now that helps me with my posture when i'm sitting in a seat presenting virtually because again sitting down like this you know it changes the feel of it it changes your authority but with the pillow behind me you know it gives me that arch in my back that gives me the stand-up authority so that's another thing about virtual presentations um, the last thing I'll say on that, because I don't want to take it too long with that one question, is if you are um, a person whose mind kind of goes around a lot, mine does, right? And so I try to limit as much as I possibly can with all the clicks. Like some people get on here and they do some dynamic stuff, right? With their presentations. That just ain't me. That ain't what I do, right? I just come and deliver in the manner that is effective for me, right? And so figure out what works for you in a virtual presentation. Just because, you know, someone could come in and do a lot of um, moving slides and animations and all that, and they can still be effective. If that's not your bag, own that and own what works for you. If, simple, if simplicity is key and critical for your effectiveness, own that right in your virtual presentation um, and I think the last thing about virtual presentations again it goes back to practice um, if your company uses a tool that you don't normally use take time out to become familiar with it do the tutorials on YouTube I go to YouTube University all the time right so go to YouTube University and figure out how do I you know if, if you're if your um, superior wants you to do a visual demonstration then go take the tutorial in advance because you also want to maintain your authority in your presentation by being able to navigate the tools to even get through the presentation, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, Derek asks, he's a member of Mahogany. He's asked, did you feel a lot of pressure being the only Black woman in? <laughs> yes, ask me all the questions, y'all. Um, <laughs> So I'm a person who knows that I am uniquely positioned where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. Um, and so uh, because my purpose, right, was very clear, I knew that it wasn't about me in the newsroom. And that helped to relieve a lot of the pressure. Um, one thing my brother said to me, because my brother went to a PWI, I was HBCU, all Black, all day, everything growing up. And my brother told me coming in, he said, don't go in there being the advocate for the entire black race go in there and be crystal and show up and show out as crystal and that's all you got to do because in me being me i was able to show up in the way that i brought a lot of guests on air meaning i increased diversity by 85 percent while i was there in my role because I was the only black person in the newsroom and I defaulted to my Rolodex. So when we needed a legal expert or if we needed a political expert who could speak on the topic, who was highly qualified and well-versed to be there as a producer, I would reach out to my Rolodex, right? The same thing that my newsroom was doing, right? 77% of all newsrooms are all white men over 45 years old. So your Rolodex looks like who you're around, right? It looks like they look like your alumni association. So they were just doing what was natural. So I did what was natural and I was very comfortable with that. And so to get a long way to wrap up a whole presentation on that, you know, I always felt um, the desire to have significant impact in the role that I knew was bigger than me, right? So that alleviated a lot of pressure. And I also am the person that I'm going to show up and show out. And so what I did initially, because I had never worked in network news, um, I did a lot of research in advance. Um, I would come in an hour early for a 4.30 a.m. shift because I knew that I needed to read in on international news. I didn't know where, you know, Texas was, you know what I'm saying? Like, I just didn't know. So I would have to come in an hour earlier to research, where is this, right? What are they doing over there? So, you know, and I think that people thought that I was just like this excellent person who just wanted to show up early for work. Nah, y'all, I needed to figure out what was going on in this newsroom, right? I think that the most important thing in being in those environments where you feel like you, 
you know, I hear these terms like imposter syndrome and you feel isolated, just be you, right? I knew that I was a black girl that grew up in West Baltimore who had amazing experiences in my journey. And I never tried to alter that to make other people comfortable, right? And so in that, I think I was able to have a lot of impact and, and be effective as well. Mm-hmm. And we had a discussion of, uh, about this, um, I think it was over the summer in, at our ERG, just about bring, being your authentic self, bringing your authentic authentic self to work. Um, so, you know, we're, we're right there with you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And bring it to, and bring it to your presentations, right? Mm-hmm. You know, most of the time, and I know we're, we're, we're at the time now, but most of the time, most of my days I'm presenting to extremely old, rich white men. Right. And I will never be an old, rich white man. Right. And so I got to show up as crystal because me trying to be them is not going to be effective. Right. You know, it's not going to show them the need and the desire for the things that I'm doing. So I always say, just again, to reiterate what Radia said, always be authentic, especially in your presentations, because when you are trying to be somebody else on top of trying to deliver content, it's just not going to resonate well. Hmm. Well, listen, Crystal, you know, I could sit and talk to you all day long. It's so informative. Um, we'll be sending out these tips, this presentation to everyone. Um, as you can see, Crystal is just a phenomenal, phenomenal person. I want us all to just send her positive vibes as she goes along her journey of pitching and, and presenting and getting funding for her for her new technology. Mm-hmm. As you can see, Crystal is part of what I call my um, executive board. Um, you just really get people around you who are positive, who are encouraging, um, who could give you great advice. She is somebody, one of my go-tos. Um, and, you know, I just really thought it was important that I share her with um, not only Namek, she's she's done work with Namek before, but also the uh, Black ERG here at Pride Global. My mahoganies, I love my mahoganies. Yes, yeah, mahogany. <laughs> <laughs> love it. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So keep it, you have her information. I'll be sending her information out. Um, again, follow her on Instagram. She has some great stuff on there. And I will see everyone soon. I want to thank the NAMIC uh, members and the Mahogany members for jumping on with us this afternoon. Crystal, do you have any closing goodbyes you want to say? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, guys, like, Thank you for having me first. Thank you, Radia, for always thinking of me. But I think something just landed on me, and I feel like it's something that somebody might be struggling with, is that, you know, at the end of the day, you are in your position for a reason, right? And show up that way. You know, show up that way knowing that. Because I know that the, the things that we experience in corporate America, the things that we experience in our day-to-day work can more oftentimes than not make us forget you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it. I know that you're in that position for a reason. And I know that that's something that sustains me on a day-to-day. So that would be my closing remarks when you think about how you're presenting and showing up in, in the work that you do. Ooh, that just gave me chills. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, CB. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure seeing everybody. I appreciate you guys. Rade, I'm going to text you after this. You know that. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Thank you for joining, everyone. We'll see you soon. Bye.